Excellent. Well, hello again. My name is Jason Brittenberg, Vice President of SSTI. Very happy to be joined by so many of you today, as well as our friends at EDA as we talk about another exciting funding opportunity through the Build to Scale program. Um, if you're not familiar with it, that's a program that SSTI has supported for a long time. We think it's a great model of federal funding being focused on the goals, trying to help regions increase the amount of activity that you all have in terms of entrepreneurship, tech development, access to risk capital, trying to create new companies, new excellent, exciting technologies, and ultimately new employment opportunities for people. And then what's great about it is that Build to Scale provides that funding in a way that lets really puts the onus on the regions to identify what your needs, what your strengths are, and match the funding then um, with regards to that purpose instead of being as focused on making you use one specific model to try to reach those goals. So we think that is a, a great approach here. And again, excited to have this um, funding opportunity be available. Um, just a couple things. I see a lot of people relatively new, at least the program, if not to SSTI. So just a um, couple of comments here. State Science Technology Institute, we just go by SSTI because in addition to working with states, we also work with quite a lot of organizations, including institutions of higher education, nonprofits, federal labs, and others who are all focused on trying to create a better future through science, technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship. One of the things that we are working on is the Tech-Based Economic Development Community of Practice. Tech-Based Economic Development, or TBED, is one of EDA's investment priorities, represented very well by the Build to Scale program, as well as investments happening through economic adjustment, public works, and of course, the Tech Hubs program and others. And we're working with EDA to help collect more information and about what's happening across the country in TBED, and of course, working to connect other grantees with each other so that we can understand what's happening and try to help provide some additional resources to strengthen the work that you are all doing. And you can learn more about the webinars and other resources that we have at ssti.org slash TBEDCOP. Just one quick announcement before I jump in on some resources and then turn things over to EDA. I want to make sure you are available about the SSTI 2024 annual conference. Um, we have this coming up in December, the 10th through 12th, and that's going to be providing a lot of opportunities for practitioners from all across the field to get to talk with each other about what's happening in your regions. We have a very discussion focused event where you can really learn from each other, build your network, a couple of things to highlight in particular will be focused on thinking about what comes next in 2025. A lot of new technological developments that have really changed some of the ways that people are thinking about work and about economic development in the future, as well as definitely going to have a presidential transition, possibly big congressional elections as well. So what does all that mean for the field of TBED, in addition to a lot of opportunities to connect with federal funders and with each other? So hope you will all be able to join us there. I also want to add, because of our partnership with EDA, as well as some of the other agencies, we're able to offer the conference at a low rate, just $4.95 for two days. It's not much above our cost. So again, certainly hope you guys can join us. Um, wanted to, again, just take a, a couple of moments here for a little bit of an introduction. So the first thing that I'm going to do is pop up a quick poll. The first one is a similar question to what we had at registration. Um, noticed on the registration forms that an awful lot of people are brand new to build to scale, which is great. Hopefully you've all had a chance to actually check through on the notice of funding opportunity, which will answer a bunch of questions. Um, but you know, great to see you in here if you're completely new to the program. Um, also had a lot of people experience, but helpful to do the poll here to just check where people are who actually log in. So I'll give everyone a moment or two to complete that. The other question, of course, that we have on here um, is what types of additional resources you would be most interested in seeing in the future. Um, if you're selecting the other option, like about 10% of people have so far, please feel free to throw it in the chat or um, the Q&A if that's easier and let us know what kinds of things you have in mind. It would be great to know. Um, so again, as I'm seeing these results coming in, it looks like about a third of the audience has never applied, but is familiar. Almost half the audience, though, is completely new to the program. And just um, around a quarter of the audience is either a prior awardee or a prior applicant. So that's that's great. Very helpful to understand as 
Um, well, hopefully it's helpful for Eric as he frames his comments and decides uh, what he's going to share with people. Um, so excellent. Just pop that up on the screen here for just a moment so that people can see those results from your colleagues. All right. And then just a couple of resources I'm going to point people to. Um, SSTI, again, been supporting the Build a Scale program for a long time. So we do have a number of resources that are available. We'll send these out as well in the follow-up email so that all of you have access to that, as well as a new map that we're putting together that may be helpful with some of the points that um, are relevant to the competition here. But just to highlight for you, we've got a recent webinar about Build to Scale success stories, webinar about grant management, other webinars from years past relating to the Build to Scale program specifically as well, in addition to other issues like measurement and communications in a TBEG context that may be helpful. Um, as those of you who are looking at putting together your actual proposal, identifying the level of activity you have in your regions, one flag that we have, articles providing information largely at the state level, but sometimes at the metro or county level as well, data on investment activity, research activity, workforce activity that may be useful. And then one thing to flag for people, um, I'm not sure if Eric is planning on bringing this up or not, but something I'd like to point out when I know that people are interested in applying for this program is that EDA has their past debrief um, webinars up on their site. And in particular, last year's slides have some very helpful examples of what is a general, vague, non-specific answer and what is a specific answer that's helpful for maximizing your points. So again, especially if you're a new applicant, want to highlight that for all of you. So that is all I want to say for now. Obviously, you guys don't particularly want to hear from me anyway. So let me, without any further ado, go ahead and turn things over to Eric Smith, Tech Hub's director with EDA. Thanks, Jason. And hi, everybody. Um, Jason, of course, we want to hear from you. Um, so, uh, but but in seriousness, um, also very thankful uh, for the opportunity uh, to speak with you all today and, and for to Jason and SSTI for for hosting us here um, to make sure that we can get uh, the word out about the program and this new NOFO. Um, we've got, um, you know, some things to share, um, some uh, new aspects, some continuing aspects um, of this program. So uh, let's jump into the slides here. Um, we'll talk about the history. Um, we'll give you an overview of the program as it is now and a little bit of application guidance. Um, although I will highlight what Jason mentioned, uh, there is a lot of good content uh, about kind of you know what makes a what makes a good application, what's a concrete description of activities. Um, you know we've had uh, several cycles of this program now, and there's a there are a lot of resources up on the on the website, and a lot of that uh, is applicable regardless of any uh, any changes that we've had. Um, and this PowerPoint you can see will be available uh, at that link. Um, so if you're looking for the PowerPoint um, separately from just the recording, um, it'll be available there as well. Uh, so let's go through a little bit of history. Um, the statutory authority, so Congress's uh, grant of uh, kind of duty and responsibility to us uh, is part of the Stevenson Widely Technology Innovation Act of 1980. Uh, it's a little bit misleading. Uh, the act was originally passed in 1980, uh, but it's been amended several times. Um, and the authority for Build to Scale was actually added in 2011. Um, and we were on a first appropriated funds for this in, in 2014, dedicated funds. Um, so really about, uh, about 10 years, about a decade, a little more uh, of history of this program. Um, and you can see here um, the quote um, about what we're really supposed to be aiming for, um, increasing innovation-driven economic opportunity uh, within regions uh, throughout the U.S. Um, so uh, innovation programs writ large at EDA, uh, the Office of Innovation Entrepreneurship was established back in 2009. Um, and we, again, received authority for uh, what is now the Build to Scale program back in 2011. Um, first appropriations dedicated for that uh, came through in 2014. Um, the program at that time was called the Regional Innovation Strategies Program. Um, that was a, you know, there were multiple streams of funding um, that eventually evolved into um, the Venture Challenge and the Capital Challenge under the Build to Scale program, which is just the 
new uh, new brand um, for the the regional innovation strategies program. Um, and in 2024, we've made some additional changes uh, to simplify some of these some of the structure. So we'll get into that um, a little bit uh, later in this presentation. Um, investments to date, uh, this gives you a, a little bit of a history of appropriations for us. Um, so the amount of funding that Congress has made available um, in uh, fiscal year 2024, uh, Congress made available $50 million again. So uh, the program's really grown uh, over the last decade. Um, and we're uh, again this year deploying again $50 million um, through the program. Um, so let's talk about what that program looks like uh, this year. Um, again, looking to advance innovation economies. Um, we're looking to accelerate adoption and delivery of technology products and services. Ultimately, um, you know, making these regions more economically successful and more economically competitive and doing that by leveraging uh, the fruits of innovation and technology development. Very high level um, points here, $50 million available. Um, we expect to make uh, approximately 40 to 50 awards. Um, while that um, you know, depends on the amount of funding we have available, it also depends upon um, the applications we get um, from you all and, and other folks who submit um, exactly the number of awards that we're able to support. Um, and we expect a wide range here. So you know, from hundreds of thousands of dollars to uh, up to 5 million. Um, one thing to note about this program that is different than uh, every other EDA program is that we have a strict statutory, no exceptions, one-to-one -one match. Um, so this is a pretty high match rate. This means that for every dollar uh, that we choose to fund you for, you have to have a committed dollar uh, from another non-federal source or nearly every case a non-federal source. So we'll talk more about that later as well. Um, and we usually expect these types of projects, depending on budget and scope to run two to five years. Um, and we estimate that start date uh, will be in, um, uh, actually, I think that is a little bit of a typo. And, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, winter 2025. So the beginning of calendar year 2025. Um, Program goals, um, these are good to keep in mind because uh, when it comes down to it, the evaluation criteria, what we are, uh, what we're doing, what we're looking for in your application is ultimately um, we're looking for our dollar, um, our grant dollar to result in the impact that we're aiming for. Um, so you can see here, uh, building capacity for entrepreneurs um, to invent, improve, and, and bring to market new projects in emerging, emerging and transformative uh, industries, uh, accelerating the growth of regional economies, uh, doing that by leveraging innovation, technology maturation, building on these industries of the future, um, empowering communities to provide proof of concept and commercialization assistance to innovators and entrepreneurs, um, really that messy middle of figuring out um, how to take a great idea that works on the lab bench um, and make it work in the real world and make it able to be uh, manufactured, delivered um, at, at scale, and ultimately increasing access to capital um, and doing that equitably and inclusively so that uh, these entrepreneurs can uh, not just invent things, but also uh, grow the businesses that uh, produce them. One important thing to note is that while we focus a lot on entrepreneurs in this program, because we are, uh, at the end of the day, uh, looking to support technology entrepreneurs, um, the types of organizations that we directly fund um, think of as intermediaries. So these are organizations that are supporting entrepreneurs. Um, so the Build to Scale program does not directly fund uh, entrepreneurs, does not directly fund startup companies. Um, we fund organizations that then um, support founders, uh, entrepreneurs, and startups in a variety of different ways. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, you know, if you are a, a founder or startup in the audience, 
um, if this funding uh, is likely not for you, but it could be for an organization uh, that you work with that supports you in your region. So make sure that those organizations know about the program. Uh, a little more specifically, um, these are the organizational types um, that are eligible. Um, so Congress has given us a list that, uh, that we work within. Um, that can be a state, uh, a native uh, or indigenous organization or a city or other political subdivision of a state. Um, so county, municipality, et cetera. Um, so those organizations can, are eligible to apply. Um, these other organizations, nonprofit institutions, institutions of higher education, public private partnerships, science and research parks, federal labs, venture development organization, economic development organization, or a consortium of uh, any of those organizations are eligible to apply. The caveat I'll put there is that the state or the city or another political subdivision uh, needs to provide um, evidence of support. So you just need a, a support letter from one of those organizations, but that is also a, a statutory requirement. So we don't have any flexibility there. Um, I'll also say that uh, these words uh, in some situations um, have slightly different definitions. And this is probably one of the many times where I will point you to the notice of funding opportunity, uh, which I'll talk about as the NOFO frequently. Um, but that document has all the details you'll need um, around definitions of these things, as well as many other aspects of the program. So really suggest, uh, as Jason did, that you, you take, a, uh, take a read uh, of the notice of funding opportunity. Um, and we'll have some uh, frequently asked questions that we update on a, on a regular basis also throughout the, the application period. Um, oftentimes, uh, organizations um, decide to partner um, with uh, either co-applicants um, or co-recipients if you're, if you're awarded funding under this, uh, sub-recipients, proposed sub-recipients or contractors. Um, all of those types of organizations can uh, be federally funded, uh, which means uh, getting funding um, from this grant. So that's EDA funding or match funding. Um, unfunded project partners um, can also be part of this. So if there's a, you know, activities that are going on, um, but that aren't funded, but it's an important partner, those, those partners can also participate. Um, and uh, we actually have some uh, regulatory guidance around the differences between subrecipients and contractors. Um, so this is a thing that we'll analyze um, in looking at your application. Not, uh, not usually something that's a, a cause for uh, rejection, but can result in some uh, back and forth. Um, so I would suggest you take a look at this. I think the, the, the tighter that this is up front, kind of what the relationships between all the partners are, um, the better, um, and, and a lot of information can be found there and um, on our website and, and in the NOFO. Um, aside from eligible entities and organizations, we also want to talk about eligible activities. Um, so our funding uh, is very flexible, uh, although there are some things that we cannot fund. Um, so our funding uh, is really for non-construction. So this is for operational and programmatic costs. Um, it, it, that can be really broad across different types of projects or funding. Um, so you can see here um, equipment, um, the operation of facilities, uh, the provision of expertise, uh, other resources uh, that can be made available for shared use and for a broad range of entrepreneurs. Um, via some sort of objective and unbiased process, um, can also encompass activities specifically around um, formation uh, and deployment of capital. Um, so this is uh, equity-based capital specifically. Um, so it could be uh, angel seed or venture funds, could be uh, angel networks, um, could be related to debt equity hybrid structures, um, one thing to note here is that we, we don't fund, we're unable to fund pure debt uh, financing. So that's, that's one caveat um, and one constraint that we operate within. Um, a few other constraints, things that are not uh, eligible for funding under this program. Um, 
So no direct transfers um, to beneficiaries. So no just direct uh, pass through of funds to uh, startup companies or to individuals. Um, we can't use uh, funding, EDA funding or, or match funding uh, to subsidize expenses that aren't related to the program activities. And that I think specifically I'd like to highlight general operating expenses. So we cannot um, subsidize that. Um, our funding and the match funding cannot be used as investment capital. Um, so while we support uh, the operation and formation um, of funds um, and of investment vehicles, um, our funding cannot be, um, cannot be used as any of that investment capital. Um, and again, we also don't support pure debt. Um, our funding also cannot duplicate other federal funding. This is one that we really look out for. Um, so whether that's another EDA award, whether that's another uh, Department of Commerce award or anywhere across the federal government, um, we cannot duplicate any other federal funding. So if you've got other federal funding supporting your activities, uh, make sure to explain and, and demonstrate how this funding would be aligned with and complementary to, but not duplicative of uh, that other funding. Um, and, you know, specifically on that, um, we can't fund things that are uh, you know, paid for uh, with federal funds or that's going to be, or that's paid for with funding that is used as match or cost share on another federal award. So um, those are the, those are the don'ts uh, when it comes to uh, activities. Um, so in 2024, um, we've actually made some changes here based on some feedback we've gotten um, to really simplify the structure of this program and also to enable activities that often naturally fit together around supporting entrepreneurs and increasing access to capital. Um, so all applications um, in this year's 2024 uh, build to scale program uh, will come in under the implementation challenge. Uh, so this combines the former venture challenge and capital challenge into a single challenge um, focused again, as always on technology entrepreneurship um, in a particular region, leveraging that particular region's assets in uh, a clear technology area. And proposals will uh, outline, um, again, competitive proposals will outline um, how the project will address these four areas. So strengthening economic competitiveness, enhancing commercialization products, processes, and outcomes, uh, remediating structural barriers that inhibit uh, translating innovation capacity into economic activity, um, and again, leveraging regional uh, competitive strengths. So really keen to, to focus on uh, what those strengths are in your region and your ecosystem and, and build upon those. Uh, we talked about this before and we'll emphasize it again. One-to-one uh, -one match is absolutely required. Uh, there are a lot of federal programs out there that um, have lower match rates or that have mechanisms for certain types of organizations or uh, projects located in certain areas to have uh, different match rates um, and a higher federal share of costs. That is not an option um, under the Build to Scale program. Uh, our statute does not allow uh, for a lower match rate. Um, that said, uh, more match is also not necessary to qualify for funding and it won't um, necessarily make you more competitive. Um, we do have a, a separate conceit called uh, commitments, which we'll talk about, um, but when it comes to match, so that's the, the cost share required um, the funding that uh, is subject to the same constraints as the federal funding, uh, that one-to-one -one match is required, uh, but uh, more match than that. So more uh, matching funds does not make an application more competitive. Um, and one of the things that uh, we have done in this program frequently over the, the last several years and will continue to do here is, uh, you know, post, uh, post application uh, before considering an application for award, we uh, may agree to reduce the matching share um, at, uh, prior to award uh, to, to any rate that's just not lower than one to one. So in regardless, in every case, uh, even if we had agreed to do that, you're gonna have a minimum of one to one match required. So for every one of our dollars, uh, we need um, a dollar uh, cash or in kind uh, from, from you all. 
We also uh, added a consideration um, to help align the place-based investments um, across the uh, administration. Um, and we're uh, doing that initially with some uh, sibling programs. Um, so that's the Tech Hubs program and the National Science Foundation's Regional Innovation Engines program. Um, so there are a small number of points um, available in the evaluation criteria uh, to uh, organizations that are uh, proposing projects in uh, these tech hub or engine regions um, that are aligned with the particular technology focus um, and strategy of those regions. Um, again, check out the NOFO. Uh, there's a good amount of information uh, on uh, alignment and exactly how this works. But um, if you are associated with uh, working with uh, aligned with a, a tech hub or engine, um, please pay particular uh, attention to this, uh, these uh, points that are available to you all. Let's jump into application guidance. Um, so this is a lot of nitty gritty about what's required. Um, and we are here to help uh, make these as clear as possible. If you've got questions about this, um, check out the NOFO, check out the FAQs, but also feel free uh, to ask the team. Um, we're uh, here to help during this application period. We, we can't offer substantive advice on, on uh, kind of your approach or strategy or theory of the case, but we can absolutely help with uh, navigating the NOFO and its requirements. Um, so please do reach out um, if you've got any questions. Um, so a uh, handful of things here, really top level, make sure you uh, know what your UEI is, um, your uh, entity identifier, uh, that's an important number and required. Uh, make sure that you're registered in SAM.gov if you don't know what I'm talking about by SAM.gov, or if you know you're not registered in SAM.gov, uh, go do that now um, would be my suggestion. Uh, doing that as early as possible is key. Um, you know, those are colleagues uh, that manage that uh, service, uh, not part of the Commerce Department. Um, you know, they've got a great system for doing that, but it can take some time. So really suggest that you, uh, you go do that now and make sure you're registered in SAM as soon as possible. Um, you'll also need an account in EDGE, um, that's EDA's uh, grant application and grant management platform. Um, the link to that is there. So once you've got uh, your SAM registration, you can register there. Um, and then make sure that you've got your application complete in EDGE and submitted via EDGE uh, by the deadline, which is 4.59 p.m. Eastern time on October 28th. Uh, so keep that in mind um, and make sure that you submit everything before that deadline. Um, we, we can't accept um, applications that come in late. Also, with respect to your application, there are uh, several forms that are forms or documents that are required um, for every application. Um, so that's a project narrative. That's really your, your core document that lays out your approach. Um, your budget narrative and staffing plan, uh, that's what substantiates kind of uh, what it is gonna cost to uh, achieve what you put forth in your project narrative and, and what, the, what the folks who are gonna staff that, uh, what that staffing plan looks like. Uh, we also need to see uh, letters that document your matching share. Uh, so we need evidence in support of the particular uh, match uh, that you're claiming and so that we can know that you've met at least that one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, you'll all need to support, uh, submit an SF-424, standard form 424, and a standard form 424A. Uh, you'll also need to submit a, a CD-511. This is uh, talking about your lobbying activities, if any, or indicating that you don't have any lobbying activities. And then you also have to uh, indicate your project service area uh, at the county level with FIP co FIPS codes. Um, so those, uh, that's how we know um, the, the particular service area uh, of your proposed project. There are some additional forms um, that um, may apply um, or different additional forms of documentation that may apply depending on your particular circumstances. Um, so a letter um, from uh, the regional innovation officer or a lead consortium member from an aligned tech hub 
or from the lead entity of an aligned NSF engine. Uh, this next requirement, the single point of contact compliance documentation, um, depending on which state you live in, um, you may have a state single point of contact um, and that state single point of contact may review grant applications before um, they can be submitted to us. Um, so if you've got uh, any questions about that, we have links in the NOFO um, to the list of states that do participate in this and in those states uh, who you have to contact and how you get through that process. So that's one where I suggest, again, checking uh, early if you're interested so you know you've got to go through that because um, that does vary um, quite uh, significantly state by state. Um, organizational documentation. So depending on the type of organization you are, um, we'll need a certificate of good standing, your articles of the corporation, your bylaws or whatever the equivalents are in your state. Um, if you're claiming indirect costs above the de minimis rate, uh, we'll need the agreement, the documents, your indirect cost rate. Um, in some cases, you may need to uh, submit an SFLL. That is another form regarding lobbying activities. Um, and then uh, in the case of some equipment installation, um, you may need to submit uh, environmental um, and historic preservation documentation. Um, you see that there are more details, again, available in the NOFO. And, and of course, let us know if you've got questions. We'll spend a little bit more time on uh, some of the pieces in particular. So on the project narrative, uh, we've got a set of uh, different sections that we'd like you to include. Um, the NOFO sets out these sections. So uh, please organize your, your project narrative around these sections. We've got an executive summary, uh, vision, mission, goals, and roles. Um, we want to understand your perspective of and what are the land, what's the landscape when it comes to regional resources and assets. Um, we need to understand your proposed solution uh, and a concise scope of work. Um, we want to understand collaboration across the region, um, uh, measurable goals and outcomes, and a sustainability plan. So um, how will this program continue to provide impact or, or how will it uh, sunset uh, when when it's achieved its goals. A um, few kind of tips here, um, be clear, be concise. Um, there's not a ton of space. You know, we try to give uh, the right amount of space, but make sure that you're clear and concise. Um, make sure you're really identifying that gap. Um, and I think another way of saying this is, you know, be upfront about what the challenges are that you're facing in your region and your particular industry. Um, and that makes it more clear to us um, how your solution is going to uh, address that gap um, if you're clear about what that what that gap what that challenge is um, leverage your partnerships um, we want to understand how the region works together uh, no none of these entities are working alone even if you are the the lead on a project um, this type of economic development is very much a team sport uh, make sure you're conveying what the milestones are we want to know that uh, how you know we can uh, make sure that we're tracking progress, that you're tracking your own progress, and that we have clear points that if we were to award um, your project, that that we know how to help guide and steer and help um, you all achieve the desired outcomes. Speaking of outcomes, uh, we want to we want to understand metrics. We want to know what those uh, long term forecasts are. We want to know how you're going to measure that along the way. And then really um, focus on that scope of work. We want to know ultimately um, what you're going to do with the funding, what you're going to do with the match, um, and make sure that that is, is clear and achievable um, with the resources that you've outlined. Uh, speaking of resources, budget narrative and staffing plan. So um, this will have an itemized breakdown of costs by cost category and year. Um, this should be aligned with the scope of work. We should be able to see that alignment. Um, the cost category should correspond with the SF424A and 424, so you'll see those cost categories there. Um, we also want to see the staffing plan, and we want to know which personnel are uh, critical, so which personnel are key personnel, um, and also uh, make sure you're accounting for indirect costs. Um, watch out for unallowable costs. We talked about things earlier that are ineligible in this program. You should also check out uh, the Code of Federal Regulations uh, that's cited here, 2 CFR 200 subpart E. Um, and again, 
to the sort of opposite of what I said earlier about aligning with the scope of work, um, watch out for misalignment. Make sure that what you're talking about in the project narrative um, is resourced and make sure that the resources you're talking about um, are discussed in the project narrative. Uh, we've got a template, a uh, budget and staffing plan template that uh, we and many of our applicants have found uh, very useful over the years. And so I highly recommend uh, that you use that uh, template. Um, on the matching share um, commitment letters, again, this is really critically important. We have we don't have any flexibility on that one-to-one -one rate. And so we uh, need evidence that you've met uh, that minimum match requirement. Uh, these letters should include the source of the contribution. So who's providing the match? Uh, what is the nature of the match? So is it cash uh, or is it in kind? Um, whether or not it's cash or in kind, uh, we need statements that verify that that match is committed, unrestricted, and unencumbered. Uh, those are kind of magic words, but also are important. Um, so they need the funds need to be committed, un, unrestricted, and unencumbered at the time of award. Um, and if it's in kind, we need evaluation, and, and we go through uh, an analysis validating that, that that valuation for in kind contributions um, is reasonable. Um, note this restriction here on the bottom. So if you've got an organization that is providing uh, matching share, regardless of whether it's cash or in kind, uh, that organization cannot serve as a contractor in that award. Um, they can serve, they can be a subrecipient, but they can't be a contractor. So um, if you've got a situation, uh, just please watch out for that because that again is a, uh, a strict uh, constraint that we operate under. I also want to revisit uh, something I mentioned earlier with respect to state and or local government support. So basically, if you aren't a uh, government, if you aren't a state or local government or a uh, native tribal or indigenous government, um, you have to show support um, from one of those entities. Um, so the letters have to come from a state or a political subdivision thereof. Um, one key thing that is important is that federal organizations and non-governmental entities, uh, even if they are associated with government, will not meet this requirement. Uh, so uh, your federal congressperson, uh, federal senator, um, an economic development district, uh, chamber of commerce, these organizations do not satisfy this requirement. And uh, this is another strict statutory requirement that we have, you must show the support. So. Um, if you've got a relationship um, with one of those entities already, um, start reaching out to them now and talking about it. And if you don't, I really suggest you start um, exploring this now and reaching out and, and making sure uh, that getting the, the letter of support um, from one of these eligible, uh, one of these entities will, uh, is uh, something that you can achieve before the devil. Um, I do want to go through the merit review criteria. So um, we've evolved these over the years. Um, so several updates here. Um, project quality and ability to execute, um, of course, key to any uh, sort of grant. Uh, we want to make sure that this is aligned with the purpose, uh, that it's going to be able to achieve the goals that you set out that are aligned with our goals, um, and that uh, the project is feasible. Uh, we want to understand the economic impact um, of this work. Uh, we also want to understand how this is going to um, increase uh, capital formation, deployment, and access, and or what the current landscape is in the region. Um, important either way, whether or not you're directly addressing that, that capital landscape is important to entrepreneurs. Um, similarly, with talent and workforce, want to understand uh, the current uh, labor market, the current uh, workforce, uh, kind of current state of the workforce in your ecosystem, um, another critical element to entrepreneurs growing businesses um, is making sure they have access to that workforce. Um, commitments, so this goes sort of beyond um, what, uh, what, has, what you all have been able to secure with respect to strict match, but what are the other commitments that organizations uh, in your region 
um, have uh, said that they will do that's aligned with what you're doing. So uh, we're looking for relevant commitments. Uh, perhaps that is around workforce. Perhaps that's around um, providing support, mentorship, and access to networks. Perhaps that's uh, aligned investments. Uh, but what other commitments for action um, have you been able to secure from organizations within your region? Uh, we're also looking at equity and diversity, um, you know, with respect to entrepreneurship and access to capital, how are we making sure that uh, these, uh, these programs are inclusive and in increasing the extent to which the economic benefit uh, from the innovation economy is equitably, uh, accrues equitably. Um, and then last, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, a few points uh, that are available if you're aligned with um, and working within uh, a tech hub or an NSF engine. Um, a couple of common application mistakes that I really want to highlight here. Um, undermatch, uh, that's one that uh, really not possible to recover from. So it really suggests uh, being uh, super cognizant of match. Um, ineligible entities, if you've got a question about eligibility and you're not sure based on the definitions in the NOFO, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, that's not substantive, so that's something that we can uh, that's something that we can help navigate. Uh, we've certainly had uh, novel questions arise that way before. Um, missing match letters or unrealistic val valuations. So even if you've even if you believe you've met that match requirement, if you don't have evidence of the match, or if you have a valuation of um, in-kind match that's just unrealistic, that's another uh, area uh, that's a common mistake. And then last, the, the government support letters. That That is a strict statutory requirement, as I, pardon me, as I mentioned. Um, and so missing letters in that front can um, be a, um, can result in an application not being eligible just from the beginning. Um, a few application tips here. Um, so read the NOFO. Um, I'll say again, read the NOFO. Uh, it's got a lot of good information in there and will, uh, I think, really give you a, a solid understanding of what we're looking for um, with respect to application materials, but also our theory of the case and, and what kinds of investments uh, we want to make in these projects. Um, start, um, start planning for match and, and doing that outreach for securing match early on. Um, again, those can take some time to get even just practically getting through approval processes, especially if it's an outside organization. So uh, get on match early. Uh, suggest you have a, a partner, collaborator, uh, read the application uh, before you submit. So just get other sets of eyes on it to make sure that um, you've not made assumptions that we would then also have to make where we might make different ones or just to make sure that it's clear kind of addressing um, the elements of the NOFO. Uh, proofread your match letters. Again, that uh, committed, unrestricted, unencumbered um, language is important. Um, so please uh, take a look at those, make sure that language is in there, make sure that those are really clear. Um, and, uh, you know, Jason referenced some of the, the things on the website with respect to examples of language that uh, is really clear uh, versus language is really vague. We also have a lot of examples of projects um, that are on the website. Um, so you're more than welcome to, to take a look at what we've funded in the past. Um, competition timeline. Um, so we launched this competition uh, a little over a week ago on September 9th. Um, applications are due on October 28th. Um, we're planning to announce awards in winter 24, 25, um, and then uh, that anticipated start date um, for uh, work under the funded applications um, in, in winter 2025. Uh, so a uh, lo lot of time, but also a lot of work to be done in that time. So uh, again, encourage you all uh, to, to start um, early and often on, on many of those pieces that I mentioned. Um, and again, glad you're all here today um, showing interest in, in the program. Um, I see there are a lot of questions. Um, there are, here are some ways you can uh, get in touch with the team. Um, so that's our, uh, the Build a Scale program website. Um, OIE at eda.gov is the shared inbox. Um, there are real people um, behind that. And so uh, you will get a response. 
Um, and let me, um, Jake, if maybe you could highlight some questions that would be helpful for me to walk through, um, or we've got some preloaded ones here on the slide. Sure. Uh, we have one uh, that is asking about, uh, you know, can a tech hub or an NSF engine, can they support more than one build to scale proposal or are they limited to just supporting slash endorsing one uh, build to scale application? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the there's not a strict limitation there, but what I would say is that, um, you know, those those programs and this program um, all kind of are centered on this theory of um, aligning a region around uh, you know a shared strategy and shared vision. Um, so I think insofar as you're thinking about um, that, um, you know, would suggest considering like um, to what extent is that evidencing or um, providing you know evidence to the contrary of that shared vision. Um, not that that answer goes one way or the other, um, just by having multiple. Um, but, but that's one thing that I, I'd suggest considering as you're, as you're thinking about that in those regions and, and really in any region, um, as you're working to develop an application for, um, these types of programs. Excellent. Thank you. And then kind of, uh, related tangentially, can a uh, regional proposal be put forth by a range of partners potentially across multiple geographies, multiple states um, that are all maybe aligned under the same goals or the same mission? Would that be considered an eligible application for the build to scale program? Yeah, so we have pretty flexible geographic definitions here, but I think, again, what I would consider is the extent to which you're able of, as the, your geography or your proposed geography expands um, and encompasses multiple regions that are going to have different strengths and assets and, and uh, a broader uh, range of organizations and institutions, thinking about a couple of things. One, um, how do you coordinate and align around that shared vision and shared strategy? Um, and, and how are you making that case that across that region, you're really going to be able to leverage those assets and resources there. So I think that's one thing. The other thing is kind of pure, purely practical when it comes to budget. What are you going to be able to do? How are you really going to be able to have a, a meaningful, um, significant effect on the economy of that region when that region is that broad with the, uh, the amount of funding that we're talking about? So um, again, we have a, a pretty broad definition of geography there, but I do think that there are some parameters that um, of evaluation and of you know parameters around like what our goals are um, that I strongly suggest you consider as you're as you're thinking about geographies and especially if you're thinking about um, uh, an expansive geography. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question here about match. Um, does match have to come in at the uh, you know? applicant level or does it, if you're including subrecipients, do they also have to include match with their application? Good question. Uh, it, the match is calculated at the, at the application level. Um, so it can come in, um, you know, differently across subrecipients if, if there are subrecipients participating in different ways. Um, but at the application level, whatever the total uh, ask is, you just have to have that one-to-one -one match at that uh, overall application level. Excellent. And then a couple other uh, clarifying questions about the one-to-one -one match. Uh, number one, is there a limit on how much you're allowed to count for in-kind? Um, so, you know, if you're applying for $5 million, could it all $5 million of your match be in-kind? Number one. And number two, uh, is cash match scored differently than in-kind match? So uh, there's no limit. Uh, the proportion of, of match that is cash versus in kind isn't strictly capped in any way. Um, so you could have all cash, you could have all in kind, you can have a blend. Um, as far as like whether one is scored higher than the other, it's not about cash versus in kind. It's really about the quality of the match and the relevance of that match uh, to the project. Um, so we do want to make sure that the match makes sense, that it's not just totally out of left field or that it's not um, irrelevant to the program. The, the nature of the match, um, in many cases in kind, um, actually is 
could be stronger uh, because it's very clear that uh, that type of personnel, that type of expertise uh, that you're bringing in as, as in-kind match is necessary uh, or that you know, other uh, resources you're bringing to bear um, are best provided as in-kind match. So um, we don't have a preference one way or the other. We do wanna understand uh, that, it's, that it's relevant. The other thing I'd say is um, on the in-kind side though, I'll, I'll reiterate that piece about um, realistic, um, reasonable valuations. Um, so do make sure that um, those valuations that are coming in, you're, you're uh, um, considering and making sure that uh, they're reasonable. We had a question here about uh, congressional support. Uh, understanding that it's not necessary to have congressional support is it something that would make an application more competitive? Should it be left out? Uh, what are your thoughts there? It's it's not really it's not encompassed in our evaluation criteria. Um, so uh, it's really up to you whether to uh, include a letter of congressional support, uh, federal congressional support. Um, we receive those letters frequently, um, and again, not part of the evaluation criteria. So really, just up to you. Uh, but that state, local, other subnational support is a re is a requirement. So please, uh, please do focus on that. Uh, next off, Sorry, if I can jump in real quick, there's been a couple flavors of a question on match about <clears throat> federal funds that have passed through a state or local entity, and wondering if those have become eligible. Specifically, there's SSBCI, obviously the capital program funds wouldn't be because you can't use the capital dollars, but there's also technical assistance SSBCI dollars now. And then ARPO is the other example. Are either of those eligible if they, again, have first gone to a state and then been awarded to another entity? That's a great question. Um, the, the situation, um, and this is not legal advice, uh, but um, the situation with other federal funds is that in order for those funds to be eligible for match, they, that needs to be stated explicitly in the statute. Um, so it turns out that, unfortunately, that whether or not the funds have passed through a state or local government is not the determining factor. It really is program by program. Um, so if you're in a situation where you have federal funds that you think should be eligible for match, uh, that's one of those areas where I um, strongly suggest you reach out to the OIE inbox, um, let us know what the situation is and where those funds are coming from, and we can talk to our lawyers about that. Uh, just given the, um, well, particularly right now, the amount of federal funding that um, is out in the world um, and that's being spent, but just in general, given the broad array of federal programs, um, it's generally a case-by-case -case analysis. Any other questions, um, Jake? We've got plenty. Uh, the question is, you know, which ones can we answer writ large for the whole group at hand? Yeah. Um, yeah. Jake, while you're looking, I've got a couple other quick hits I can go with. Go for it. Possibly quick, Eric, uh, do your best, I guess. No. Um, <laughs> one clarification, someone, I think what they're seeing is that in the eligibility section, it says that you can have a consortium of nonprofit supply. They're wondering if they can have multiple public entities also jointly apply for the award. Is that allowed? Yeah, great question. Um, the consortium language does apply to all the eligible entities. So um, any any number of those organizations can come together as a, as a consortium to apply. Okay. Um, and then kind of nuts and bolts, and I think related to something um, Jake was mentioning earlier, but some questions about if there are particular letters of support that are more or less valuable in your evaluation. Yeah. Um, so again, that that state, local, other subnational political subdivision of the state, that one is that's a hard requirement. So I guess I would say that's the most valuable because if you if you don't have that one, uh, that makes you ineligible. Um, so that's really key. Um, beyond that, it's it's really about quality and relevance. And I'd say, um, you know, it's it's less about support. We really see evidence of support in commitments to action. And so thinking about like what are the organizations that you're partnering with or that you rely on or that are really critical members of the ecosystem, and how are they evidencing that support beyond just the letter? Um, those are the types of letters of support that provide the most value, but in different ecosystems that can really be different organizations. 
Um, so uh, there's not just like a broad category um, that are kind of of highest value. Hey, Eric, can I jump in with a question? Hi, everyone. Amanda. Um, <laughs> uh, been been active in the chat. Um, uh, actually, uh, Jake or Eric, can you flip to one of the FAQs? We have a question about a current build to scale grantees and their eligibility. And I think we actually have a slide on this. Um, that would be, there we go. This one, yeah, um, great question. Um, our current build to scale or um, any uh, current regional innovation strategies. So again, the, the prior name of this program, um, if you've got an active grant under one of those programs, uh, are, are you eligible? Um, so uh, current, um, current build to scale, um, whether that's venture capital or um, the, the one year that we had the industry challenge um, or regional innovation strategy grantees, um, you do have to have um, all of your activities under the prior year award, um, including but not limited to the final reporting requirements completed and submitted to EDA um, prior to December 1 uh, to be eligible for this competition. Um, but we also have this uh, new uh, way here. So if the application shows that your proposed activities are clearly and explicitly not just non-duplicative, but uh, also complementary to and aligned with those activities. So if you're building on that award, uh, leveraging what you've accomplished under that award, but definitely not doing uh, any of the kind of same activities, um, you may still be eligible to apply. I'd say that you know that that is a that is a high bar. Uh, so really want to make uh, really want to make clear your case for that if you are uh, looking for. Uh, funding um, and trying to be eligible under that particular um, pathway. Uh, what, I know we're just got a few minutes left, so I don't know if- uh, can, can I give you one more, Eric? Yeah. Um, we had a question in the chat that I think would be useful. It says, with respect to project service area, is there an advantage to having a broader geography such as statewide versus smaller or specific region of the state? Do you want to just generally speak to um, how we define project service areas and um, the regionality versus nationality of this program? Yeah, I think it's a great point. I think, you know, this is a, it's a question we get a lot. I think a uh, big part of that is because uh, you know we have a lot of different types of regions in this country, um, and you know different densities, different strengths, different resources, uh, and that means that you know what we what we mean by region uh, often is really context dependent. Um, I think here really think about this sort of like ecosystem, labor market, concentration of assets, like. What is the what are the things that you are leveraging in the region that are related to and relevant to um, the particular like economic uh, growth based on innovation that you're looking to achieve? And I think that that's maybe a long way of saying I think it tends to be um, a little closer. It's not necessarily state boundaries, um, maybe across the state boundaries, maybe it's um, a part of a state. Um, maybe it is a whole state in some cases. Uh, I think those like those cases certainly exist and, and we've certainly funded those things. Um, but I, it's less about like, is it a whole state or is it not, you know, it, is it multiple states or is it not? That's not really what we're looking for. We're looking for you all to define like, what is this ecosystem that has all these related things that can be leveraged together um, on which to build that um, innovation economy? Um, I think we're nearing the end here. Uh, if you've got other questions, uh, like I said, send them to oie at eda.gov. Uh, we will have uh, FAQs that we update uh, throughout the competition. Um, but with that, let me hand it back over to Jason to close things up. Great. Well, thank you again for being on. Um, a lot of questions obviously continue to come in. Um, I will say some of those Double check the NOFO again, as Eric mentioned, um, be sure to send in your questions to EDA as well, um, in addition to checking those FAQs. Um, want to pop up just one other quick poll here, appreciate some um, quick 
feedback and thoughts from people in addition to suggestions for other topics you'd like to see us cover in the future. Um, so please make a quick response on that. You know, feel free to also use that question two box to provide some um, uh, longer form feedback if you prefer. Again, we'll have a lot of tech-based economic development content available at SSTI's conference. We'll be sharing that um, uh, information with people in the, the follow-up email as well. Also want to flag for those of you interested in community colleges and workforce issues, we've got a webinar this Thursday afternoon that's going to be focused on um, community college models that are particularly active in regional innovation economies. So I encourage you all to check out that. Again, it will be in the follow-up and also available from SSTI.org. Um, once again, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Amanda, for all being active and trying to address these questions. Um, a lot of new people, so a lot of things to cover. Appreciate you guys taking the time. Um, we'll be sharing out the recording. We'll be sharing out the, the questions that were answered in the chat. We'll be sharing out the slides and sharing out the resources that I mentioned at the start, as well as links to some of the EDA materials as well. Um, with that, thank you all for the afternoon, and I'll talk with everybody again soon, I'm sure. Thank you.